Revelation chapter 18, verses 9 through 24. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gain wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence, and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. The voice of a bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who have been slain on earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now that we would receive it with faith in you, and that it would shape how we think and how we live. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, perhaps the most troubling situation in the world right now uh, is the situation that's occurring in Venezuela. I'm not sure how many of you are following that in, in our own news here in America, but the, the country of Venezuela, a, an oil-rich country, is falling apart in front of our eyes. Um, the, the socialist dictator, the leader, Nicolas Maduro, he's been there since 2013, is, and you're watching it happen, he's running the, the country into the ground. He's bankrupting the country, and so as you watch what's happening over the last few months, even this week, there are food shortages, there are medicine shortages, there are no jobs, there's no food. The only thing that seems to be in abundance there is drugs and crime. I mean, it's a country in total collapse, and it's sad for the people there. It's also sad because this is one of the most oil-rich countries in the world. Uh, I read this past week that because of what's happening in their economy, the inflation rates in Venezuela is on target that it could, by the end of this year, hit an inflation rate of a million percent. Just think about that for a minute. A million percent inflation. If we had that in America, if we had that in Mount Pleasant, I mean, the old village would be, I mean, they'd be rioting in the streets. Streets. I mean, there would be people in golf carts just going crazy in the old village. I mean, just torches. I mean, it would, be, it would be riots. It would be chaos if we had that level of inflation. Um, it's a total mess. It's total chaos. And it's sad to see because it's impacting people's lives. I read also this week, someone said this. I thought it was a very good way to say it. He said, Venezuela isn't being run by bad socialists. It's being run by criminals. They're running that country into the ground for their own benefit. 
The responses, thank you, Brian. The responses to the collapse of this country are interesting, to say the least. There are several different responses. The first is you see the response of the U.S. and Canada and several countries in Europe, which is basically putting sanctions, heavy sanctions on Venezuela and, and telling Maduro to walk away from power and give it back to the National Assembly. That's the response of our country, uh, from Canada, from several European countries, is to tell him to, to vacate his power because of what he's done. That's not what every country and every leader has said. He's had some support. Uh, the leader of Venezuela, Maduro, has had some, some support, um, surprisingly, from Russia and Cuba. Um, shocking news, right, that they would support him. But they're supporting him and telling, hey, he just needs more time to, to turn things around and trying to support him. The response inside the country is pretty horrific. The response from the people living there under those conditions is, is unbelievable. Thousands every day are fleeing to surrounding countries. They're fleeing to Colombia. They're, they're fleeing to Brazil. Some are trying to flee to America. Some are trying to flee to Europe and find jobs, wherever they can support themselves. That's the response. Some people are staying there and just trying to survive. They're getting in the food lines and, and waiting for food. Some are marching and protesting, trying to take back their country. And others are just trying to survive because it's a desperate situation. Because the, the country of Venezuela, it's sad to see, is, is completely falling apart. In front of our eyes, we're watching it happen. We're watching it fall apart. As we look at the end of Revelation 18, it's a similar scene to what you see in, in Venezuela. In this sense. Revelation 18, 9 through 24, is a description of the complete collapse of a city, of an empire, of, of Rome. And it gives us the response of several different types of people. So what we look at this morning is the collapse of Rome and the response as people watch what is happening to the Roman Empire. That's what we see. And as we study it, look at it this morning... Remember, the prophecy is primarily about Rome, but it's also showing us that this is what will happen ultimately to every city, to every civilization that opposes God. Every city, every civilization that opposes God will fall. It will face God's just wrath and judgment. And so it is about Rome, but it also demonstrates what will happen when you oppose God. So let's look first at the first response to the fall of Rome. That's given in verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 give us the first response, and it's the, a picture of the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth. And these are really the, the client kings that are subservient to the Roman emperor. These are the, the nations that serve Rome and give Caesar honor and wealth. It says they watch, John says, as Rome burns to the ground. They watch from a distance, these, these powerful kings and leaders around the world who have been honoring and honoring Rome and part of the Roman system, they watch from a distance as the smoke of the city rises. They watch as it's being just devastated and conquered. And it says they weep over the collapse of Rome. They mourn over it. It's devastating to them. But notice also what they do not do. They don't try to come and help. The kings of the earth that serve Rome don't say, hey, let's get our armies together to help support Rome and keep this thing going so we can keep our own power. They don't do that. They don't come to the aid of Rome. They don't try to defend Rome against God's judgment at all. They keep their distance. They want to avoid that judgment because it's overwhelming. It's a flood of divine wrath. And they're trying to avoid the same fate that is hitting Rome. And so they cry out. They mourn. They weep. And they say here in the text that Rome's judgment has come not in a day, which we saw last week, it comes in a day, which was building on the, the, the plagues of Exodus, which came over months. Last week we saw it came in a day. Here it says it intensifies it. and says it comes in an hour. That judgment comes in an hour. Verse 11, the mighty city of Babylon, meaning Rome, in a single hour your judgment has come. So I studied that and I was thinking about it this week. It, it did remind me just of how quickly things can change. And, and just seeing the, the, the pictures on the news of, of the devastating tornadoes, uh, in Alabama, which happened last Sunday, almost a week ago. And in a matter of minutes, a tornado, one of them, um, the tornado was 170 miles an hour, half mile wide, struck down just like that. And in a matter of minutes, lives were ended and lives were changed forever. 
it was that swift, it was that quick. Kind of a, a devastating picture, but also an image that reminds us, it gives us something tangible as we look at this and see that when God's judgment comes, it happens quickly, it happens swiftly, and it's overwhelming. It's life-changing and life-ending for people. And so in verses 9 and 10, we see the response of these client kings that serve Rome. It says they watch the destruction of Rome and they mourn, they weep over it because they're losing power. They're losing influence. They're losing the system that they're used to using. And they do not welcome God's judgment. They don't welcome it. They don't rejoice over it. They oppose it because they oppose God's plan. They oppose the triune God. They have set themselves, set themselves up against God and His work. They're opposed to it. And so when God comes in judgment, their world is devastated and then crumbles and falls apart. So that's the first response. The second response is found in verses 11 through 19. That's the second response. We see here the, the response of the merchants, the mariners, the salesmen, everyone who's made a lot of money off of this Roman system. And how do they respond? What, what is their response to this? Look at verse 11. It says, they cry, they weep over the loss of money because they realize that with the destruction coming to Rome, they're going to lose their ability to make so much money selling their gold, their silver, their jewelry, their expensive artifacts, food, and there's a whole list here. They mourn over that because they're going to lose money. And John gives us a very long list here of things. He lists things to show really the luxury, the extravagance of, of the Roman Empire. He also does that for another specific reason, because it's very similar to a list found in Ezekiel chapter 27, an Old Testament prophet. Ezekiel 27, which was written several centuries earlier, details the, the fall of the uh, the, the little island kingdom of Tyre. Tyre was a wealthy place and a very proud place. They sold things, they bought things, and they made a lot of money, and they kind of had their island fortress, and no one could capture them, and they were proud of that. Ezekiel 27 lists all the things that they were buying and selling, and then Ezekiel 27 says, your day is coming and you will fall. And the people of Tyre probably laughed at that. They laughed at that until Alexander the Great came marching in and laid siege to Tyre, and totally demolished them, and either killed them or sold them into slavery. And then the game was over, game over for Tyre. So John is building on that imagery from Ezekiel 27 here, and saying just as it was lights out, game over for that island nation of Tyre, that kingdom, the same thing will happen to Rome. And that's why he gives us this list of expensive items to show what happened to Tyre will happen to, to Rome, and, and shows the luxury and the economic activity of the Roman Empire. And it really is impressive, if you think about it, if you look through that whole list and study where those things were coming from, it's a very impressive list. There are metals from Spain, precious stones from India, pearls from the Persian Gulf, silk imported from China, wood from Morocco, marble from Africa, bronze from Corinth, cinnamon from East Africa. I mean, we just have to go to Publix for that. Wheat from Egypt. I read this past week that one of the Roman Caesars, uh, he, he died fairly early on, uh, he had some pretty expensive tastes. He would import, speaking of luxury items, he would import the brains of peacocks to eat. That was a luxury. He would import the tongues of different birds to eat. That was kind of his delicacy and luxury. They were importing bird brains and bird tongues to eat. Pretty remarkable. But what John is describing here is he's describing an economic activity in the Roman Empire that's pretty much global. Rome was running ships everywhere. And many got wealthy off of it, and they lived for that wealth rather than living for God. That was their idol. They weren't worshiping an actual idol. They were worshiping their, their bottom line, their checking account. But notice one more thing about this list, one more thing that stands out about their trade and their commerce. It's at the very end, verse 13. John says they traded wheat, they traded cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves. Human souls. And throughout the Roman Empire, they were buying and selling animals. And they were buying and selling people as if they were animals. And making a lot of money off of it. And that, it's an interesting point that John makes here, because oftentimes, I think in our own culture, we think slavery is a problem that was just a huge issue for uh, the American South. And it was. But it's also a reminder that slavery has been a global problem since day one. Because sinful humanity, given the opportunity to 
put someone under your own control and to make money off of someone and to control someone else's life. Throughout the history of civilization, people have said, yeah, I think I'll do that. I think I'll take advantage of somebody else and use them. And it still happens today. Um, I read this morning, I saw a headline that came up on, on my computer this morning. I was up way too early. Um, I think this is up in Seattle. I mean, they, they, there was an FBI raid. I think they found 25 or 26 women who were sex slaves in Seattle that were freed. I mean, that stuff happens globally. The idea of slavery, of imprisoning someone else for your own benefit, is still something that's a problem. Rome made a lot of money off of slavery, the Roman Empire, and it was very common. It's estimated they had as many as 60 million slaves at one point in the Roman Empire. Which, to put that in more manageable terms, I mean, that's more than the population of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, and Florida put together. I mean, that's a lot of people. And they were making money off of it. And John says, you're going to pay the price for that. You're going to give an account for that. And the people that are making money off of this, the merchants, the people selling this, verse 15 shows us their response. Like the kings, they watch from a distance. They don't come and help. They weep and mourn because they're going to lose money. They're going to lose their wealth off of this. And future wealth, all the homes that they were planning on buying and and building, all the nice stuff that they could get. They were mourning over that. Verse 17 expands that scene and includes all of those who are traveling on the seas in the Roman Empire to make money. All those people carrying goods. So, for example, one of the things I mentioned earlier, they had people who, importers and exporters, who would travel to East Africa and um, pick up cinnamon, big amounts of cinnamon, to bring back to Rome. And that was, generally speaking, that was a two-year round trip for cinnamon to bring it back to Rome. Those are the people included in this who were spending their lives on the seas to make money and to, to gather wealth. Those people are, are going to mourn and weep as Rome collapses. And so here in verses 11 through 19, the merchants, the salesmen, everyone who's making all this money, they mourn over God's judgment because they're losing what they live for. They're losing that wealth that they were living for. And they oppose God's work of redemption. They oppose God's work of judgment. Because they have set themselves up against God. They're not living for God. And so their world crashes and crumbles when God returns to make things right and to bring wrath and punishment on Rome. Verses 20 through 24, the final section here, shows us, one, the actual destruction of Rome, but also the third response. And that third response comes from God's people. How do God's people respond to the collapse of Rome? as they see it happening. And you see it, it says in verse 20, Rejoice, heaven, and saints, and apostles, and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. It's a command not to, not to weep, not to mourn, not to be upset, but to rejoice and to celebrate over God's work of redemption, to celebrate in God's justice, to welcome God's work of redemption, which includes punishing evil, rewarding God's people, but punishing evil and injustice. He, and he says here, it's for you, because the primary reason listed is because Rome had opposed God's people, and they were suffering. They were being persecuted for their belief in Christ. And so God tells his people to celebrate, to throw a party, because God has overturned a wicked and depraved and evil world. Don't mourn it, don't weep over it, don't be sad when this happens, but celebrate God's justice. Celebrate that God keeps his promises. That he promised that he would make things right and he is going to do that. And so the third response is completely different. It's the response of God's people that celebrate God's work of redemption, his work of judging an evil empire. Verse 21 shows us a unique scene. It shows a mighty angel taking a large millstone and he throws it into the sea and says that Babylon or Rome will drown in her wickedness, drown in her wickedness on the day of the Lord. It's an interesting scene. So what's happening here? What is this strong, mighty angel doing? Well, if if you remember back, I don't know know which month we were in these chapters, but chapter 5, we saw a strong or mighty angel with a scroll. And then we saw that same angel in chapter 10 with a scroll revealing God's plan of redemption, what God was doing. Those are the two instances of a mighty or a strong angel. Now we see the third example of a strong or mighty, mighty angel who is hurling this millstone and a millstone, you probably know, too large for a human to move. It would have been moved probably by a mule or something in that culture because it was too heavy. 
Well, this angel can move it. He's the strong angel. He can handle it. And he throws it into the water to demonstrate that Rome is over. And really what's happening, and, and you see this throughout John's, throughout John's letter here, Revelation, is, and I try to point these out as, as often as we can, it's a reference back to the Old Testament because John is using allusions and references to the Old Testament. Here, this is a reference to Jeremiah 51. In Jeremiah 51, Jeremiah had a servant, and he told his servant, take a large stone and bind it to a book and hurl it into the river, announcing that Babylon will be judged. That the country, the nation of Babylon will be judged. And so what John is doing here is he's alluding to that, to Jeremiah 51, that just as the first Babylon was destroyed, Rome, as another type of Babylon, will be destroyed as well. That's what he's referencing. And it's a, it's a good way to use, use that illustration because drowning was a common punishment in the Roman Empire. Um, if you were arrested for something with capital punishment as the, the penalty, a common way to dispose of you is to tie you to a crate of rocks and hurl you into the Ashley River or the Cooper River, or whatever river was nearby, and you're done. That's justice. We'll see you later. You're not coming to the top. That was a common way to inflict capital punishment in the Roman Empire. John's using that on Rome with a reference to Jeremiah 51, death by drowning. And the final verses show us the aftermath of that judgment. And it really is a pretty quiet scene in Rome uh, after that. Verse 22 through 24, he says, There's no music, there's no craftsmen, there's no blacksmiths, there's no one working on iron or woodworkers, there's no sound of industry, there's no music from weddings taking place. The lights are off, he says, it's complete darkness. There's nothing happening at night. There's no one working the third shift to make some more money to build a small business up. There's no one coming home from a concert or a festival with their torches lit, having a good time. What John is saying is this is a complete ghost town. It's a complete town that has been shut down and, and devastated. Nothing has happened here. Which again would have been amazing for John to write from his isolated, quiet place on an island. To write about that, about the Roman Empire. Just, just astonishing, amazing. So he's describing Rome not as a thriving empire, but as an abandoned ghost town. And in summary here, what John is saying is that Rome has removed the pleasures of life from the saints, from God's people. Rome, the system of Rome, the people of Rome, the leaders of Rome have removed all the pleasures of life and made life difficult, and in many cases persecuted God's people. And now God will return the favor back to Rome. There's no work, there's no music, no celebration, nothing. They will be destroyed. And God's people should celebrate because God is being just. He is doing what is right. He is punishing sin. He is punishing evil. That's the response. And so chapter 18 shows us these three responses. The response from the statesmen or the politicians, and now the sailors, the salesmen, people, the merchants making money, and then finally the saints. And this chapter, as you can tell, is all about the fall of Rome. And John has these allusions, as I mentioned, to Ezekiel 27, the fall of Tyre, the fall of the first Babylon, Jeremiah 51. And what John is telling us, I think, is that just as those nations fell, Tyre and Babylon and now Rome, every city and every civilization that opposes God will face judgment because they are opposing God. That is going to happen. Not just Rome, but every city and every civilization will be destroyed, will face judgment for sin and for evil. Because God's redemptive plan, part of that is to make sure all wrongs have been righted and to punish wickedness, to punish evil. So as we think about that this morning, what is your response as you read this to God's punishment on sin and on evil? What is your response to what you read in Revelation 18? How do you respond to the fact that the Bible does promise that God will one day make everything right and He will punish sin and evil and remove it permanently. How do you respond to that? How do you think about the fact that the Bible says, this isn't my opinion, this is God's Word, that God will judge cities and civilizations and citizens for their sin, for their wickedness, for their rebellion against God, for refusing to give God the honor that is due Him. God will hold them in account. How do you respond to that? Is it remorse? Is it regret? 
Or do you rejoice like the saints here did, that rejoice over God's work because you know your hope is found in God and in His promises to you? How do you respond? Is it more a response of fear or is it a response of faith? Because you're trusting in God's promises and you know that you, you belong to Him. The same author wrote John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10. That he says, Christ is the good shepherd. He doesn't lose his sheep. And so when God returns to bring judgment, He's not going to lose His own. That's a promise. And so if you're trusting Him, it's a response of faith. So most of the response that we saw here in chapter 18 is a response of remorse, regret, mourning over the loss of temporary things. The loss of influence, the loss of power, the loss of money and wealth and success. But yet the saints, as we saw in verse 20, rejoice because they know they have an eternal hope. Because they're not living just for temporal things. They're living for something much greater. They're living for someone much greater than anyone else. So what is your response when you think about God's work of redemption, God's work of making all things new and and judging evil and rewarding His people. How do you respond to that? I think this morning, your response to Revelation 18 is probably conditioned on your response to another event. Your response to what you read this morning is probably conditioned on your response to the cross and the resurrection. Because if you think about the cross and think about the death of the Son of God at Calvary, if it doesn't mean that much to you, that means you probably don't think you need it. You probably think you're a pretty good person who can kind of do your best, and at the end of, end of your time, you've got enough good credits that will outweigh the bad credits, and, and maybe when God returns, it'll be okay. There's not a lot of confidence in that position, I've got to be honest. The Bible gives you no confidence in that position. And so if your response to the cross is, ah, it's kind of important, maybe God shows his love there in that way. But if that's your response and the idea that God's coming back and he's making a clear line between who belongs to him and who doesn't, that can bring about some fear. That can bring about some remorse, some regret. But if you know, as you think about the cross, that that is your only hope. That the cross, he's your only hope because that's where Christ suffers for you. He takes on the punishment that is due you. He takes on God's wrath. He is your substitute. He atones for your sin, covers your sins, and reconciles you to a holy God. If you're fully committed to that and fully believe that, then the idea that God's coming back is something to rejoice about because you know your future is secure. And you have that assurance because God's word tells you that. We see that throughout Scripture. That you don't have to be good enough because Christ is perfect. He is good enough for you if you're trusting in Him. And He has taken your place at the cross. And because of that, you have no fear in life or in death. Because of what He's done for you. So we look at Revelation 18. So we look at God's Word. It reminds us of the danger of only living for this moment. The danger of only living for this life. The danger of only living for what is temporary. And it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to live every day and and to think what we see, what we hear, what we touch, that's all there is. And to have a limited perspective based just on what we can see and experience. But hopefully we are living for something greater than that. Hopefully our priorities are not just what we see and what we experience. Hopefully not just tangible things, materialistic things that will come and go. Revelation 18 reveals that cities and civilizations will rise and fall according to God's plan, according to God's counsel. But ultimately, God's going to bring every city and civilization and citizen to account, to justice. And if if you find your identity and find your life in the death of Christ, in the cross, then your response to reading something like this should be one of rejoicing that finally God will remove sin and evil wickedness and we will live with Him. And you will celebrate His plan of redemption. And you will celebrate that God keeps His promises because of the death of Christ. Because your only hope is found not in yourself, but in what He has done for you. This morning, as as we take the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, think about that as as we take the bread, as we take the juice. Think about the truth of, of what the death of Christ means. And that because your identity is found in Christ and what He has done for you, you can celebrate 
what we read in Revelation 18, and, and look forward to and rejoice about the coming of Christ and, and His work. So think about that. Reflect on that this morning as we take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray.